Hello, everyone. This is Rick with the Cyber Pro Podcast. We normally do five questions in nine minutes, but today we're changing it up a little bit. As you'll see, I have four wonderful podcast guests, and we are going to be talking through a number of fun questions. Let's get it started. Max, we're kicking this first question off to you. Who are you? What do you do? And who is your cybersecurity hero and why? Well, Rick, thanks for having us uh, get together today. This is really an exciting effort and looking forward to having a great conversation. So thanks again for bringing us together. My cyber hero, boy, uh, there is one person in particular who stands out of the crowd. Uh, but before I go there, a little bit about me. I am what uh, I self-proclaimed cyber farmer. I sow a lot of seeds of cybersecurity. And really what we're doing today is exactly that. Uh, we are all co to collectively sowing seeds of cybersecurity. And I'm able to do a lot of that actually through and with my cyber hero, Gary Bergman. Uh, he is the host of the Defenders of the Cyber Hero Network. And every single week he brings a bunch of us together to uh, talk about the latest challenges and bringing in people from industry, academia, the government to talk about some of uh, our biggest and our smallest challenges uh, from bringing on new people and getting people trained to uh, working with the director of CISA to improve really the cyber posture of the entire U.S. And so I can't think of a better cyber hero than that, somebody that brings the entire U.S. together. That's awesome. I love Gary. He's a great guy. Deidre, let's go to you. Who are you? What do you do? Who is your cybersecurity hero and why? Yes, awesome. Thanks for having me. Uh, so I am a, a, a human with high EQ that loves to build teams and happens to be building one at CyberSN and Secure Diversity, where we're solving the job searching and matching issue that society has at, while focusing on underrepresented uh, humans uh, and bringing more folks who into cybersecurity. And so uh, I, uh, I really love building teams and solving problems for society. I'm a social criminal justice major. So this world fits well for me. I'm 50. So I've been doing it a long time. And my hero, this was hard for me because I came up through sales. It's a different experience uh, than those of us that are practitioners. And, uh, and so I had to think and I thought, well, two people came to mind. One is Tosti Kamakis, who's the uh, co-founder of Rapid7 and certainly the founder of Nexpos. And he and I worked for uh, the two same founders. I worked for him for 21 years. Uh, he's still at Rapid7 and uh, you know what have you. My point is that he came from another company and started Rapid7. I wouldn't have been able to be the VP of sales. Uh, if he didn't do that, because uh, I worked for those same people. And so, uh, and it really has been wonderful for me as a social criminal justice major uh, to find this community. I didn't become a criminal attorney. And so uh, I'm so thankful that uh, I found the community, you know, 13 years into my career. So he's my hero. So is my cyber SN chief security and technology officer, because six years ago, he was the first person that was able to give me the taxonomy that I needed. I knew this, this this industry needed help. I came from a long history of talent before I went to Rapid7 as the head of sales. And so anyhow, the taxonomy for the common language in all cybersecurity roles is so important to our future that I'm so thankful I found him. He was my third go <laughs> and he's been here six years. So uh, I'm super uh, thankful for him. Wonderful. And you meant 29, right? Yes, yes, yes. I feel 29. I'll tell you that. That's another story. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Charles, you're up next. Who are you? What do you do? And who is your cybersecurity hero and why? Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Rick, again for this invitation to participate. Very excited to be here with you all. Uh, I am a first generation college grad originally from Indianapolis, Indiana, currently reside in the D.C. area. And I like to say I am navigating this uh, human experience at the intersection of being a black male LGBTQ tech professional um, today and everything that comes with that. <laughs> um, my cybersecurity hero would be uh, someone you may or may not have heard of and it's Robert Bigman, we call him Bob Bigman. He was the first cybersecurity, uh, uh, I'm sorry, first chief information security officer for the Central Intelligence Agency and actually established their information security group 
It's the person I worked for when I first got into the cyberspace. And why he's my hero is because one thing I admired, he never allowed politics to trump security. That's awesome. That's a big name to fill. So Jax, we're jumping over to you. Uh, who are you? What do you do? And who is your cybersecurity hero and why? Awesome. Thank you, Rick, for having me. And I just want to say one thing, Charles, I don't know if you did this on purpose, but it was kind of funny you threw politics in there and then you threw in Trump. <laughs> it was good. So a little bit about me, um, 13 years uh, cybersecurity and IT experience. And currently I run my own cybersecurity company, really trying to, uh, I've revamped the company within the last like eight months within the GRC space. And I do a lot of stuff within YouTube. I have a podcast and I'm really focused on the education piece uh, within cybersecurity, educating organizations, but also the community on what security looks like. So I thought about the last part of this, like who's your cybersecurity hero? Can it be Daydre? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> no, she's definitely, I, I love what she does. Um, but I was thinking about this. I had so many people coming coming around in my mind. I would say probably Dr. Gerald Osher. I absolutely love what he does. He's really made a huge impact on the industry and he is the chief content creator for Simply Cyber. So I always look up to him and everything that he's doing. Yeah. Question number two, what does the great resignation look like in cybersecurity? And I'm gonna have Deidre kick us off with this. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so without being depressing, I will tell you that it's, uh, it's been significant. It's been so significant that we, I released some data, Wall Street Journal picked some of it, so just picked it up in some other publications uh, to show that we saw nationally, and this is U.S. data, we are the largest cybersecurity staffing firm in the U.S. We do primarily PERM work. There isn't a whole lot of contract in security. It's starting to come. It's mostly perm. And so uh, what we would see uh, is traditionally, why would somebody would be leaving? The first thing out of their mouth was either the people they were working for, uh, one person that they're not enjoying is not helping support them moving forward. Uh, and, there isn't, and, and that's sort of buried in opportunity, typically. And so it's, it sort of goes along with opportunity. And that would sort of be the first thing that's coming out of people's mouths. Well, we uh, looked at data from 2,000 professionals uh, from uh, you know last year and uh, into this year, and uh, what was their reason for leaving when they came to CyberSN? And uh, the number one uh, answer was, "I'm completely burned out." Like it's the first thing that came out of their mouth. We've all heard of burnout; it's been around us, but I can tell you, it's never been the first thing out of people's mouths when we ask, "What's the reason you're looking?" Why are you talking to me? And so uh, we saw, we know that why that happened. Supporting IT, never mind, you know, more attacks, never mind our own lives at home being completely, you know, thrown off by COVID. Uh, another piece that was interesting that came out from that research was that we were able to separate East and West Coast folks, so to speak. Uh, and um, on the West Coast, we saw an even higher level of burnout from the perspective of workload based on uh, acquisitions and mergers. So during COVID, we all know more billionaires were made than ever. That means that more companies transacted and merged and, and acquired, and therefore security professionals were buried in double to triple the amount of mergers and acquisitions on top of everything else. And so but we, that was really a West Coast thing, though, which is super interesting because prior to COVID, remote didn't exist, really. I mean, that was not here. So we were able to look at East and West in that way. And so I would say that, uh, you know, uh, it, it's been dire. People retired early, people exhausted. And so what we see is the companies that have high EQ, emotional intelligence, that really care about how people think, feel, and perceive and are in that conversation, they're retaining talent. They're not losing talent whatsoever. Those that aren't in that conversation didn't really think about those things and come to their uh, teammates with solutions of how to navigate this world we just got thrown into. Those people left. And uh, it was uh, you know six times greater than we normally saw uh, at the end of last year. Thank you very much for that. I always talk about servant leadership and I feel that that's exactly what you're driving towards as well. Charles, you're up. 
So um, I'd actually like to say, based on what uh, Deidre has just outlined for us, that the great resignation for many has looked like opportunity <laughs> because those folks who left, there are other folks who are trying to go into those organizations and are benefiting from the lessons learned. Um, those organizations who have lost them, uh, more people are looking for flexibility. They're looking for increased pay. And that comes with the fact that these folks have left, these organizations have left a void and now folks are willing to either pay more or give more flexibility to incoming professionals, um, whether it be uh, individuals transitioning out of government into private sector. Uh, by day, I am a government, a federal government employee um, doing cybersecurity compliance. So we've lost a number of professionals out of my government agency who have left to go for the private sector. It's created opportunities. And likewise, it's opened up opportunities for others who would like to move up or take on higher roles because now there's not as much competition within these organizations for uh, promotions because they've lost folks. There's also opportunities for people to come in and get the promotions that they've been looking for as well. So it's been a mixed bag. And I agree that it really kind of depends on where you live, what the job market is like here residing in the DC area. There's no question that there are just bountiful opportunities in cyber. So most folks have taken advantage of the fact that now that we're doing this remote teleworking, I can live anywhere. I know within my network and the folks I talk to, it's like, hey, I can make DC money and live somewhere else. So most of them have resigned and look for other opportunities in other places. Very, very insightful. Thank you for that. Jax, kicking it off to you. So you guys have covered so much of what I was going to cover. So I'm going to try not to just reiterate what you both have said, because the, the, I think they're spot on. Um, something that I want to highlight was what Deidre said was about the acquisitions. And for me, I actually personally experienced this. When you have acquisitions, you have all these mergers, you have new startups. And what I have been seeing, and I witnessed this myself, is you get into these startups. And when you get into a startup, there's 20 or 30 people. And when you get in there, you're wearing you know five to 10 hats. And it goes back to burnout. So I think that that is a big factor is because we are seeing so many startups coming into this, this sector right now. And then just to highlight a little bit about what Charles said, the, the individuals that have worked at startups, including myself, I actually am avoiding those. I want to go to an organization that has some stability, that gives me a good package, that provides me unlimited time off and I can work from home and I'm not working 80, 90 hours. So I think that we're going to start seeing more of this shift because the certain organizations are starting to realize that it's environment, 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 and culture, like all plays a part in, because we can control our environment when we're working at home. And a lot of people want to work at home, but what we can't control a lot of time is also the culture and our leadership. So a lot of individuals are starting to focus on that. And there's a saying, and I believe it's very true is there's no bad teams. They're just bad leaders. And it's meaning it's not saying that that person is a bad leader. They just don't know how to have a high IQ. They don't know how to listen to their people and understand and have empathy. So I think as we move into that space, which we're seeing within certain organizations, this big resignation is going to hopefully start to slow down a little bit further. Now, and that's, that's an amazing point talking about culture. And so I appreciate the way you brought that up. It's about the leadership taking an understanding of the culture around them and making that culture better. Max, Rick, it's- Rick, sorry. I would love to just comment on that. Please. You know, uh, and, and Charles and Jax both, both hit it, that companies will change. They have to, you know, when I first started building my uh, matching solution uh, and a place for professionals to have their profile, I said to, I said to my team, and I still say it to this day, when people can make a move and job change quickly, companies will feel it. They're not feeling it now and they haven't felt it because it takes six months to a year for the average person that's got experience to get their next role once they start looking. What a joke. So that means that these companies get to, you know, have these people around that don't want to be around. And that's a vulnerability by itself with another, you know, another place we could go down. But the, you know, the reality is that I'm so excited. This is the flip side of this. I'm excited because companies will feel the pain at a greater level than ever because of remote. 
uh, you hit it on the nail on the head, Charles. Like I won't even work a, a job at this point with our company. We're making a policy. And if they want us to work it and it's not remote, we're doubling the price. Because what we've seen is it takes us, if we can fill it, it takes twice as long. So, uh, so you know, it's, it can be done. It's just the cost of that is greater. So, but, you know, so there is some real silver linings to include the folks that are new to cyber who have been struggling like crazy to get in. Well, now companies are more open to training, which is the only reason they can't get in is because companies haven't been open to training. And I don't blame them necessarily because they don't have the resources or the time they're fighting and they're not able to even pick their heads up. And so, you know, these silver linings are, are upon us, which is great. Which is great. Max, take us home. Boy, it's uh, you all hit some great uh, notes. And Rick, you started talking about it. Culture eats strategy for lunch. And unfortunately, culture comes from the top. It means it comes from the leaders. Uh, and boy, Jack was hit the nail on the head. We have leaders that are, are lacking EQ. We have leaders that really, they don't understand what it means to be a leader. And so people are leaving leaders. They don't generally leave because of compensation, although that is definitely a factor. People really leave because of, of poor leadership. And then uh, on top of the great resignation, which I, I wanna also call the great firing, because if you don't have the jab, you're out of here. Oh, uh, Right, so we have another issue on top of it, which is making it even more difficult. So uh, we can also call this uh, the great opportunity because this is a great opportunity for the analyst, a great opportunity for the technician, not necessarily a great opportunity for the business uh, or, or the team, because they're gonna have to pay a lot more now. Uh, so you're gonna have to do more with less, which also means that we're not going to have as strong a cybersecurity for our nation. And that is gonna be our issue for 2022. Any follow-up? I mean, solid points and so dead on. And uh, so the jab, as you said, I'm going to steal it, Max. Uh, we have not only seen people have to resign because of the force, but those taking jobs, you know, who don't want to get vaccinated, the offers falling through. And, and really, it's because companies don't have their policies down yet. We just saw the federal government or the Supreme Court justice, you know, do what they did last week. And people had been waiting to really put their policies in place. And and so all that ambiguity caused people that were, I'm not getting vaccinated to not take that job because of the ambiguity for sure. Uh, and I forgot about, I need to add that to my notes. Third question, to decrease cyber incidents impacting the business and individuals, should we focus more on stopping bad actors or educating our public? Charles, let's start with you. Yes, I believe we need to spend more time educating the public. <laughs> we have already spent enough money on the technology and all the other stuff trying to stop the bad actors. Educating the public is so important. As you know, in cybersecurity, your weakest link is generally that employee or that individual within your organization that has those rights, that has that access, that knows about the internal workings of your company. And those are the ones through social engineering that are causing a lot of the mayhem that we're seeing within the cybersecurity space. I often try to bring it home by talking closer to home about the individuals right within our family. Uh, my mom, for example, she gets alerts on her phone. She's like, I don't know what that alert was, but I just clicked okay and it went away. <laughs> That's not the fix. <laughs> we need to start educating people and helping them better understand the threats that are out there. It's just not enough to say, don't click on that email or don't give away or create a strong password. I think we need to do more and spend efforts in actually educating people about the threats that affect the enterprise in our organizations. Um, I will speak for mine, you know, within the government, we have our annual cybersecurity training. And yet, in spite that, someone still goes and does the thing that they weren't supposed to do. And what we do is we tell them, well, in order to get back on the network, you have to go take the training again. Well, if that training didn't work the first time, <laughs> it's probably not going to work the second time. So spending more time investing in training that meets the needs of the users. And I think, and I've spoken to this in other forums, that oftentimes I think that's where we go wrong. You make the training so high level, talking about policies and all these fictitious scenarios, instead of giving people real world scenarios of how actions that they're taking and things that they're doing impact the overall cybersecurity hygiene of your organization, 
And when it comes to our families and individuals, it's the same thing. Are we changing the passwords on our home routers? Are we making sure that we're VPNing when we're in public workspaces, but not just saying it, but educating on people on the importance of it, why it's important, why you should do it, and then taking that same education and sharing it with others. I think when you get a laptop, just like when you do a car, I think you should be giving a user manual on how to keep yourself secure. The user manuals are online, so you got to get online first. <laughs> so let's kick it off to Jax. I'm excited to hear your answer. My first pass, and I'm throwing under the bus on this, she's a military person. She's going to shoot the bad actor. Am I right or wrong? <laughs> that's so funny. Well, that's funny because I thought about this, and I want to say both. Um, because I think both are critically important because we can't stop defending the threat. We can't, we can't negate and say we need to just focus on education because technology and the adversary are growing at such a rapid pace. However, and this, will, this is something we'll talk about a little later, is where do breaches usually start? And they start with human error, technically, a lot of times. Now, there are zero-day vulnerabilities and things like that, but the likelihood of those happening to a network are a lot less reduced. And the reason being is threat actors know that the weak, weakest link is a human being. And we're talking about, I like what Charles said about like the network and the infrastructure. I want to take it even a step lower, is educating our children, starting at the lowest level and start implementing this into schools at the lowest level. An example I use around this is, you know, we all know what to do if we get caught on fire. We stop, drop and roll. We all know that, that is the saying, but none of us, I'm pretty sure, have actually caught on fire. However, we all know what to do, but when it comes to a phishing email, we, we use the term, see something, say something, but that even in my mind doesn't correlate to a phishing attack or a possible social engineering attack. So we need to start simplifying the training and really leveraging and getting the students and the employees and the staff and leadership to understand what does it mean to be breached and then start doing it outside of just doing phishing email attacks in classroom studies, like engaging them, showing them what a breach looks like. How easy is it to do a spray and pray technique? And then what happens to your computer when that happens? So I think both, but if I had to pick one, I would definitely say the human aspect is the most critical because that's where we see most of the vulnerabilities take place. Very, very fair point. So Max? Well, uh, I'm going to have to go a different direction on this one. Uh, I don't really think it's either, and here's why. The, we're not going to stop the adversary, the bad actors. There's tons of juvenile delinquents out there. I used to be one, and I'm going to attack something. Uh, so we, we're not going to do away with it. So we have to recognize that, that we cannot do away with the bad actors. In fact, we're educating the bad actors and teaching them how to attack us. Thank you, Microsoft and Patch Tuesday. <laughs> uh, we, and educating uh, our, the public is very important uh, as like we are doing right now. But more than the public, I think that, and we talked about this earlier, leadership, it starts at the top and uh, whether we look at organizations or we look at our national leaders, Congress is a perfect representation of how little people know about cybersecurity. And so I'm begging everyone, write your Congress uh, <clears throat> representative uh, and tell them we need more cyber uh, experience in, in your staff because they're, they're going to create laws in the very near future on the blockchain. And it's quite possibly going to stifle innovation because they don't know a darn thing about cybersecurity. So if we're going to, to really focus on who we need to talk to and enlighten, we need to work with those leaders and help them understand uh, cyber speak, not necessarily geek speak, but we have to under help them understand the risk so they can make well-informed data-driven decisions. So please write your congressman or woman and let them know we need more cyber. Awesome. Deidre, bring us home. Oh my gosh. Well, how do I go after that? Hello, that's the answer. <laughs> if anything, if everything, you know, anything, the law is how we move, right? Rules, if you will. So uh, Max, you nailed it. That being said, I'm, you know, feel the same way as Jax did is what, you know, it's both, you know, technology advancing, attackers advancing. The only thing I'd say is that, uh, or add is that 
it's relatable. Charles, Charles said, we don't have relatable training. We don't, and relatable means different functions, different people, different backgrounds. They all need different training. It's not relatable. It's not really working. And as Jack said, what do you do once there's a breach? How do you even, you know, report it? Where do you report? Like none of that stop, drop and roll. I love that is there. Uh, so uh, that's it for me. All right, next question. Why is social engineering still the most common reason for a breach? And how can we focus on that human element for a better cybersecurity posture? Max, take it away. Wow, this is a, a really a loaded question because there's the great thing about cyber, there's never really a one size fits all approach. And uh, so it's the, the answer is probably going to vary for each and every organization. And, where you stand, but social engineering, humans, we're the easy pickings. And unfortunately, because we're the easy pickings, it, we are always going to be that target. And since there is a, a target on each and every one of us, we need to understand how, how we reduce our footprint to not be a target. Uh, in LinkedIn, it's a perfect example. I love using LinkedIn. Why? Because I can find out everything about anyone on LinkedIn because people want to tell everything about what they do. So like if I want to go find out who the hiring manager is, I simply use LinkedIn and figure it out. That's the, the human element that we're that I'm talking about. We we are sharing information, but are we sharing the right information? And you'd be surprised uh, about how much we're sharing the wrong information. Thank you for that. Charles, I'll have you come off mute and tell us what you think about social engineering and how to make a better cyber posture. Uh, definitely following up with what Max said, I agree. It's, it's all about human nature, uh, creatures of habit. Uh, the pandemic has showed us that we all have similar needs. Um, we all have things that we just have to have or have to have access to in order to have fulfilled lives. And unfortunately, these bad actors take advantage of that. Um, our need to be seen and heard, as Max talked about, our need um, uh, for greed. <laughs> so these clickbaits of you can get this much money or you can get this type of our need for greed, our need for uh, belonging and acceptance. I mean, all those things are just part of our, our human nature, our human psyche. And in my opinion, it's all about changing behavior. We have to change behavior. Um, you know, as we know, the similar examples like with ATM cards when they first came out, you know, don't give away your pen, you know, pr protect your pen, protect your card. We need to have those, as uh, Deidre mentioned in the last uh, chat question, practical things that we share with folks based on their everyday experiences and lives that make the realities of cybersecurity and the threats that are out there applicable to them. And the more that you do that, the more that you practice it, um, you know, I, I agree that, you know, phishing emails are just not enough. We need to have more real world scenarios of where people are walked through examples of how you could be, you know, become a victim to this and lowering, I like you talked about lowering our footprint as far as our presence on the internet and in any space where our data and other things could be compromised, we've got to shrink that. And that comes with us understanding and becoming uh, a little bit better with how we change our everyday behaviors. Awesome, Jax, you're up. I really, really love this question because working in the military, that was one thing that, um, they really taught us was understanding social engineering because of working in the different spaces uh, within high security, they, they put an emphasis on you being a target. And one of the areas was physical social engineering, somebody meeting you at a coffee shop and hanging out and you not knowing that that person was planning there. So you take those same mindset and constructs that I learned while I was in the military and you put it into phishing because the primary method that's utilized within social engineering to target these individuals is phishing. And the reason, and I know that Max and Charles have, have touched on this, one of the reasons why it is so successful is because social engineering creates a way of creating commonality and friendliness with that. It becomes a, you're a trusted source within that individual's like circle. Um, that's one way. Also, phishing is really successful because it leverages emotions, either fear or sadness. One of those, one of those areas, or I mean, fear, sadness, or joy. So, fear and sadness are in one category, and then you've got joy. Well, the area that social engineering really plays a part, both actually, is knowing. Okay, uh, Max mentioned LinkedIn. Going onto LinkedIn 
and looking at somebody's LinkedIn and looking, okay, that individual has a, has a podcast with a co-host. Well, you would assume they probably have a good relationship with that individual. So then you reach out to them on LinkedIn and say, hey, this individual told me to reach out to you. It'd be great to connect with you. And, that, and it just spirals from there. Maybe they send you an attachment or a document that they want to share something about their company with you. And the next thing you know, now you have a document in your email address that you've clicked on because you thought you had rapport and commonality with that individual. That's just one example. But the biggest thing and what I always tell people is you always want to trust but verify. And we do that in the intelligence sector. And it's where it was my way of not being too pessimistic about, you know, people reaching out to me on LinkedIn or, you know, thinking every email is a phishing email. But for me, if somebody reaches out to me on LinkedIn, I'm going to make sure is this person actually somebody that is connected with this, this individual. I think if people would start doing that one extra step and a little bit more due diligence, the, the area of being socially engineered and being attacked could reduce, but I don't know how that's going to happen. Maybe it's going to be further education, but it's, it's going to be really hard because it's really tied and leveraged by emotion and fear of like, maybe the tax collectors are after me. And if I don't click on this link to go pay my bill, I'm going to be sent to tax collection. And, you know, it's, it's a very interesting place, but social engineering is a, a very unique way that adversaries can leverage getting into our networks. Trust, but verify Ronald Reagan. Good job there. Love it. I don't know if you were alive then, but we'll go with it. <laughs> and now Deidre, let's, let's, oh no, Max wants to add something and then we'll jump over to Deidre. Right. So uh, Jack's talked about something that I, I want to pull on that thread a little bit. Military folks are very aware of their situational awareness and they're taught uh, security. And even those folks uh, can nailed by uh, social engineering. A perfect example was uh, just a couple of years ago when uh, a lot of folks were doing PT and recording their, uh, their physical training uh, on a uh, uh, running application. And bad actors were able to social engineer their way into it and figure out when and where these people were uh, at, at the very moment of the day. And so I, I bring that up so you, you all are aware that even the best uh, and the brightest in our country that are supposed to understand cybersecurity fall uh, to, um, uh, to uh, social, uh, social media and getting nailed by the, the bad actor. It, the, the challenge is how we overcome uh, when the breach occurs. And even the individual needs to have a game plan of who do they call uh, what do they do whenever the breach occurs? Deidre, bring us home. Yeah, well said. I didn't, uh, I didn't know I was a social engineer until seven years ago. <laughs> it was our chief security officer who told me, like, you are a serious social engineer. I had no idea. So I think the term social engineering, as Jax was saying, super complicated. What is it? Uh, you know, coming from sales is how do I find you? Who are you? How much can I know about you? What do you like? So I can bring that up in the call. Is there a picture on your desk that I can see when I'm in your office? Whatever, all those things. Uh, but for me as a CEO today, uh, phishing is uh, when I think social engineering, I think phishing is the number one, you know, attack. Uh, and so we spend a lot of time on education and technology to fight that. Well, a lot of fun Jeopardy games with the organization from our security team. It's awesome. Thinking about their lives, their age groups, their demographics, all of those things. Uh, and I love what um, Max said, which is, look, if an attacker is focused on you, they're going to find you. You know, So, you know, let's not make enemies. This is like the, the other point to this. Don't make enemies. Treat people well. Treat your vendors, your employees, your whoever you're doing business with well, because it's it's the automation stuff we know is going to keep coming, right? And it's just, it's not directed at me, but it's coming at me. But direct, they're going to get you at some point if they want to, because it's nothing's foolproof. And so uh, my note on that is be more kind <laughs> and, and recognize how it's a security, a, a actual security skill. Any follow-up? Yeah, I, I would hate to think um, I, my, my friends always talk about, because I talk about how <laughs> in America, we're very reactive and not proactive. I would hate to think that this situation would actually only get better once more people experience it because people don't seem to take situations seriously until it happens to them. 
So the more this continues to happen, the more it happens to folks make it breach, they actually become better at detecting these things. And it shouldn't, that shouldn't be the way, but unfortunately that may be how we get to a better position in this, in this, in this world. Yeah. Final question. How can we open up diversity in our executive management in cybersecurity and why haven't we? Deidre, start us off. Love this conversation. This is huge. Uh, so, okay, a couple of things. One is uh, most organizations do not have roles and responsibilities clearly defined such that promotion criteria is transparent. When promotion criteria is transparent, women will be promoted instead of our friends. Uh, and women are different than uh, men and uh, men in their un can have unconscious biases and feel like, oh, this person's not ready uh, because they don't feel the same way when I interact with the men. And I've seen it and I uh, all day long, it isn't necessarily uh, conscious. So if we have measurable agreements around roles and responsibilities for promotions, this a lot of this will go away because once things are transparent, fair is fair. That being said, another thing that I've noticed, and I've, um, uh, you'll see a press release between CyberSN and Secure Diversity and SANS, uh, is that two years ago, New Year's, I was stuck somewhere I didn't want to be, and I started thinking about women not being in senior executive roles in security, and so I started looking at the, the men that were in these roles, and what are their backgrounds, and it is very clear that they have high-level certifications and trainings in the leadership arena, not just cyber. Lots of investment. I'm talking $100,000, $200,000 minimum in certifications. And so uh, I've made a pledge to use the money that we raise for our events to go foster that. Now, I don't love that that's the case. I'm not an advocate of, you know, these, these search sh shall be an entry point for anybody by any means. Uh, I, we live in a system that I, we need to minimally play in to get women promoted. Uh, and so it's those two things. Uh, and um, at the end of the day, the, the, the thing that's made the most movement is legislation. So Max, I mean, you're my hero today, uh, you know, reminding all of us that it's legislation that really makes things happen. And so let's keep making legislation for equitable treatments at work and uh, we can see you know more of this too meaning people are being fined at the board level in the c-suite if there isn't diversity if and now we're seeing people be fined for retention statistics and so these things make impact unfortunately because they're tied to money so there's this sort of you know the human part of what we need to do and then there's the like never forget that only money makes things happen uh, so much like the pain that we were talking about, and if you haven't experienced a breach, it doesn't doesn't feel the same. You may not, you may act differently. Uh, so it's a it's it's it is simple to solve. Uh, the other piece is just we need more women coming in, which we're uh, you know that focus is there. It's a numbers piece, but truly there's not unfair there's not fair promotional criteria happening. And I get the calls day in day out from women. That's why they're leaving. Somebody just got promoted over me and it really ought to have been my job based on resume and it's a constant. Charles, what do you think? Can't help but say amen to what Deidre just said because it's so true. I've uh, seen in a lot of different organizations. I hear from some of my clients who come in and talk to me about career potential and growth within cybersecurity. I'm amazed at how many times I hear stories like this from different demographics and more importantly, as she mentioned, women. I think the other the facet of it is this lack of talent. Um, we're over, we're burning out the people that we already have. We're unable to find new talent, so there's no room for people to move up. We're taking advantage of everyone we have, and we're working them in multiple, as you stated before, in multiple capacities. They're wearing multiple hats. Instead of us structuring and organizing ourselves in such a way, that there's opportunities for everyone. We become very small and tight with our organizations. And as she mentioned, it's clear that oftentimes there's just no no rhyme or reason when you go to your performance review about what's next. It's like, no, we like you where you are. You just stay there. It's like, no, I'm trying to move up as well, just like others in the organization until voila, one day you wake up and there's been a new position created for someone to move up in the organization. And that is what has to stop. It has to stop. It has to be a commitment from executive leadership that this is not how we're going to do business. We're not going to support it. We're not going to turn our eyes to it when we see it. And I think that impacts people in so many of the underserved and disadvantaged communities within cyber that it's keeping the good folks from actually even staying in the field and progressing. 
Amen. So <laughs> that's a good way to start. Max, let's kick it back to you. We really have to build our, our leaders, our leaders of tomorrow. And we're starting to do that by getting more women into college uh, and, and getting them more into STEM. But that's just part of it. We need to, to build the leadership of tomorrow. And we start by having the leaders of today, especially the ones that look like me, start asking that very question. Why does everybody else around me look like me? And they, if leaders need to truly embrace EQ, and if they embrace EQ and learn more about themselves, they're going to learn more about each other, or others, and they're going to learn that they're much more powerful and they're much more likely to achieve success when they're dealing with a diverse uh, group of, of thought. That's awesome. And, and I actually like the, the idea of getting people into STEM. But I heard recently that they should change it to STEAM and the A should be for the arts as an additional add-on to it. And I, and I agree with that. So thank you for bringing that up. Uh, and now it was my turn to preach a little bit. So we'll kick it off and end with Jax. I love it. Yeah, this one is a really, is a tough one for me because I've been the one on the receiving end where I haven't received the promotion or I haven't been able to be afforded the same opportunity as my male counterparts, both in cybersecurity and in the military. It was definitely different in the military because you have the rank and the structure, but it, it was an environment that I lived in and I came over to cybersecurity and I was really surprised that being a woman was still a thing. And it wasn't always a good thing, depending on the culture that you were in. in. And so for me, I want this to change. Um, I love what everybody has said. I think all of these things need to start being implemented, especially the measurable promotion criteria. That is huge. A lot of organizations just promote their buddies and you see it all the time. Um, I think that leadership needs to stop letting this happen. And we, and I think how that's going to happen is start getting more leaders that have higher EQs, that understand and have empathy. And I think we're moving in certain organizations in that way. But it also is going to take these women like myself to step out more, to have more of a voice, to continue to get educated, to get the necessary skills that we need to be competitive and more competitive and not saying more competitive than our male counterparts, but just more competitive in the market, if that's certification, if that's hands-on experience, if that's academia, whatever that looks like. But we need to have all of those things. We need incubations for, and I'm and I'm speaking from a woman's perspective, but this is for all underserved, so like for all individuals that are not receiving those opportunities. We need more incubation platforms to start fostering and developing the executive mindset so they can start thinking like an executive and they may be in a junior manager role. And then we need to see really basically systemic change. And I don't know how that's going to happen, but it has got to start with systemic change where things start shifting and moving. And I think it's going to happen when we start getting more women leaders in these roles and we start having more women owned companies that we're going to start seeing more women being served in these executive roles and also not being put there just because you're a woman, because that drives me crazy as well, or not because you're black or that you're gay, but because you have that talent to be in that seat. And we still haven't, a lot of the individuals, not a lot, but some of the individuals that are in those executive roles got there because they were diverse, not because they earned the role in a certain way. And I don't think that's fair either. We need to have that commonality and we need to figure that out. And um, I don't know how, when or how that's going to happen, but I know that we're moving in the right direction. It's just slowly. Any follow-up? Yeah, I, brilliant. Everybody was brilliant. I, I'll just add that our attackers are diverse. So if we're not diverse, then how could we th possibly understand how they think, feel, and perceive? We need diversity to defend ourselves. So if one doesn't want to do it because women are equal or underrepresented people are, are equal and the, in, in some reason they don't get that, well, better do it because your attackers are diverse and you can't possibly understand them if you're not diverse. Thank you all for being on the Fireside Chat hosted by CyberPro Podcast. I am humbled to have all four of you be so ultimately awesome and be on my, my podcast. So stay awesome and thank you. Thank you.